Thanks for coming. Uh, yeah, real quick, I guess we'll start with a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Savi Anandan. I am the uh, product manager for Spring Cloud Dataflow. And uh, I have uh, Christian here. I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah, uh, I'm privileged to part of, be part of the Dataflow team. I'm engineer there, and I'm interested in data-intensive data system. That's what I've been doing for quite some time. And you would, uh, hopefully you would see that this talk is quite related to this subject. Yeah, that's what all right. OK, so we're going to do a little bit of shuttling here. So I'm going to go uh, like 15, 20 minutes, and then Christian is going to come back here. He's going to talk about a lot of advanced stuff. So stay tuned. Um, so I'm going to get started here. Let's see. Uh, hopefully, the slides are all visible for you all. Um, so I'm going to start with a quick block check. So this is what we're going to cover today, right? Uh, we're going to talk about data and intensive applications uh, highly briefly and specifically talk about orchestration, the operational challenges for these types of applications. And then we're going to bring in Spring Cloud Dataflow. Uh, how many of you are using aware of Spring Cloud Dataflow? Yeah, it's about like 60, 70 percent. Um, and we're going to talk about Dataflow in the context of those challenges that I'm going to unpack in a minute. And we're going to use credit cards as the theme. So there's going to be a bunch of demos that we're going to uh, do. Hopefully, they all work. <laughs> we just had a really crazy time uh, making it work just before the talk. But yeah, so we're going to use credit card data. That's going to be the theme for the, uh, the entire uh, demo that we're going to walk through. And hopefully also unpack all the architecture details and how we solve it, how we solve for it uh, specifically in Spring Cloud Dataflow. And uh, we'll have an incremental demo builds up on it one after the other. Hopefully that all makes sense to you all. Um, with that said, I'm going to start with something like this. How many of you are developers? Wow. So more like 90%, maybe entire audience here is developers. So any data engineer, data scientist? No? OK, cool. So you all love writing applications, right? So it's about, you know, this is what you, you do most of the time. It's like try and explore different technologies, try and build the right, right uh, set of uh, design patterns so you have your applications running more reliably. Um, uh, but then the applications try and take different forms, right? Sometimes you might have multi-module project, multi-module application, or it could take the microservices approach. You might have multiple discrete uh, Spring Boot applications of some kind. Uh, but ultimately, they all need to run somewhere, right? And that's where the compute comes into play. These applications run in some form of a compute environment, whether it's bare metal, bare VMs, or they are running some sort of a container orchestration system. Doesn't matter. They all need to run somewhere. But you might start something like this, but over the period of time, so you might have a lot of apps, right? So they might end up adding a lot of complexity in terms of how you uh, do uh, CI, CD practice, or how you troubleshoot things. So the challenge here is a lot of, uh, once the application set grows out of scope, uh, you might have to like uh, come up with instrumentation to monitor them, um, you know, manage them from a central location. The other type of problem that you might uh, be very familiar with, of course, apps crash, right? So they end up uh, crashing slow rate. Sometimes they uh, crash in faster rate. Uh, but not, they all need to be resiliently run and brought back up if something bad happens to those applications. Uh, that's a very common problem we all see in production, right? And the third one, of course, is uh, you know, some applications require more CPU capacity or memory capacity, depending on the business logic that you're running. Uh, you might have to have an environment that's able to handle this type of workload, dynamic workload. And of course, once, once when you're running these types of apps at scale, you want to be able to like, centrally monitor them, figure out why these applications are chewing up a lot of memory or CPU cycles. Is it legitimate or is it something rogue process that's, uh, that's, that's just like, not in control? Um, and then the, uh, the other challenge that you probably are familiar with uh, is you know, once when the applications are in critical path, if one of the applications in between is choking for some reason, it could be an exception, it could be some business logic problem, it could be serialization, deserialization problem, uh, but the downstream applications are like waiting for that data, right? So you're like breaking the downstream consumers. And further downstream from that, you have your business users waiting for some, some sort of an outcome based on the request that they have placed in the system. So it's important to track for these types of problems, what I'm trying to get to. And once when you're running data intensive applications specifically, you might be partitioning, say, for example, partition by win ID. So all the vehicle data is coming in. You're partitioning by win ID. And all, so that way, the producer, when it's producing this, uh, this data for downstream consumers, uh, the unique data set for win numbers are all routed to that uh, one specific consumer. So now you can think of doing like moving window, moving average uh, sort of use cases. Uh, but when you're doing that, what happens if the application crashes? Uh, how you know that this has crashed? How you get alerts that it has, it has crashed? 
And if these applications are coming back up, how, do you, how are you going to guarantee that the orders are like processed correctly and the right consumer is receiving that data? Those are all real challenging problems, especially when you operate it in big scale. And building a modern data in NCV use case, uh, you could have a set of applications that's probably processing about a million messages per second. But then the traffic pattern changes, right? You might have, like, say, uh, 10 more cards uh, added to it or 100 more cards added to it. So you might be in a position to, like, automatically, based on the thru throughput and the latency that you probably are see seeing, you might want to be out of scaling those specific processes that's pr that, that needs to, you know, act upon the incoming data and produce the outcome so that your downstream consumers are keeping up with it. So that's an interesting problem, right, when you're operating at a bigger, bigger scale. And the last one I'm going to talk about is this. This is something that we see in commonly in customers. Uh, they might have active-active, active-passive type of uh, deployment topology. Like, for example, you might have uh, two Kubernetes clusters or two CF foundations. One is active, another one is standby. If something happens to active, you should be in a position to like circuit break and fall back to the standby. Standby becomes the active. So when you're doing this type of a complex orchestration, how are you going to make sure these applications are running correctly, especially if you're partitioning data, if you're doing some sort of a um, you know, stateful operation, how are you going to make sure these, these data, data sets are like rightly flowing through the pipeline and you're not like uh, losing any data or you're not like corrupting your downstream consumers? So it's, it's also a very important thing to keep, keep in mind, especially when you're writing data and applications. So enough of all the challenges, right? You can go on and on. See, so this is just like a surface. We, I'm just like barely touching it. Um, but then, uh, you know, just, just to highlight, I mean, obviously this is, you know, super critical, complex in terms of managing these types of workload at scale. Uh, but in the Spring team, we have, we have this saying, right? I mean, we follow this philosophy uh, so close to our heart. Uh, I've been in the Spring team for about five years now. I don't know how many times I've heard this, right? So everybody, like, super interested in, like, bringing this up as a philosophy uh, by Alan Kay. Simple things should be simple, and the complex things should be possible. So we think about these types of problems internally within our team as well, like at the framework level, at the product level. Uh, we challenge ourselves to like think about like how developers would run into these types of issues, how we can provide these types of tooling and instrumentation so they don't have to. So we think about all these problems, uh, and and that's and out, out, out of that type of uh, thinking is how Spring Cloud Dataflow was born, right? So we we came to the realization that you know there's you know two types of data intensive design patterns, uh, or even not even a design pattern, more about like a use cases so to speak. It could be streaming. It's like real time, right? You, you would want to like react to that data as and when it's happening, or it could be more offline batch processing. So Spring Cloud Dataflow specifically provides this types of coherent toolkit so you can do both, uh, both the types of use cases and run it on different cloud platforms, uh, such as like Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. So I'm going to like take a minute here and talk about specifically streaming and batch and, and what we provide from a, a product perspective. So I'm going to talk about the framework a little bit. Anybody uh, familiar with Spring Cloud Task here? About like 20%. Um, so yeah, so Spring Cloud Task is a shot load microservices, microservice applications specifically. Um, their intention is you know, they are ready to do some type of a business logic and then gracefully shut down. That's it. So I'm ephemeral by nature. I'm going to, you give me a business logic. I'm going to run it for you. Once the business logic is complete, I'm going to shut it down gracefully. That's the contract for Spring Cloud Task. You can think of use cases such as if you have like scheduled data migration job, you have some sort of an ETL uh, operation that you'd want to do, uh, or if you have an advanced machine learning model training type of use case, you could use Spring Cloud Task for that type of uh, those types of use cases. Um, but because they are ephemeral by nature, any of those types of use cases run once when they finish up, you won't see any footprint in your clusters. All the uh, containers will be gracefully shut down. How many are familiar with Spring Cloud Stream? about 20%, 30%. So Spring Cloud Stream, on the other hand, uh, is event-driven streaming uh, applications, really. Um, the, the fundamental difference between this visual and the other on the right side is Spring Cloud Stream applications are largely stateless applications. They are like you know, publishing and consuming from uh, a common middleware, such as Kafka, RabbitMQ, and other things. Um, they, are, they are just like their intention, each of those applications do one thing and one thing only, but they are like, operating at the end of the day because of this uh, idea of logical topics that are connected between these applications. They come together as a stream processing pipeline, so to, so to speak. Um, so that's Spring Cloud Stream. And using that framework, you can build a number of use cases here as well. Some of the things that we see in the enterprise is uh, you, know, you are you're probably doing enterprise integration pattern, or you're building an event-driven architecture where which things like event sourcing or CQRS 
uh, those types of design patterns you can build with this uh, framework. And of course, the analytics one, if you have like a large uh, IoT fleet management type of use cases, uh, we have customers doing, uh, you know, Spring Cloud Stream, using Spring Cloud Stream to solve for those use cases. So these are two frameworks, right? So now you're using your developer, you're developing these types of applications, batch applications and streaming applications. You're working on it standalone. You're building these applications. Once when this grows out of scope, this, is, this goes back to one of the challenges that I was talking about, right? So once when the, the set of applications that you're building goes, grows out of scope, you need to think about like, how am I gonna like centrally manage them? How am I gonna like centrally monitor them? How am I gonna think about like alerting if something goes wrong within these applications? That's exactly where Spring Cloud, Spring Cloud Dataflow comes into play. So the same applications that you're working standalone in your sandbox, in your laptop, or even running it in the cloud for, for, for instance, the same application, you can register those applications, specifically the metadata about the application. The metadata meaning the Maven artifact, um, the coordinate, or the Docker registry, the, if it's a Docker image, and, and it shows up in the palette. And as soon as it shows up in the palette, you just like drag and drop and build a, either a streaming uh, pipeline or a batch pipeline. Uh, the first, difference between first and the second visual here is the first one is linear. It goes from left to right. So as and when all the data is happening upstream, it's going to like push it downstream for one app, from one app to another app uh, using Kafka, like bro message brokers. The second one is more top to bottom. Right? So you ha it's, it's a direct cyclic graph, so to speak. Uh, you have n number of applications. They're all in ephemeral by nature. They are running and then like doing its operation, shutting down going one after the other, as in how you define in the graph. And Dataflow ultimately deploys these types of topologies onto cloud platforms like Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry. Uh, once when it, it, it orchestrated this type of uh, deployment topology into cloud platforms, you then need to like have a monitoring experience, uh, which is exactly what Dataflow provides with the help of uh, monitoring tools, which is the focus of this talk. We're gonna get into the details now. And specifically, we, we, we provide more native experience for streams and batch jobs. Uh, and, and again, from the dashboard, you'd be able to like launch the Grafana UI to like quickly track what might be going wrong. So this is at like super, you know, 50,000 foot uh, high level architecture of how Dataflow comes together, brings all these types of central uh, orchestration and type of monitoring uh, experience for you for the stream and task apps. Um, and I guess it, it goes into specifically build. We provide those two frameworks, and you're running and deploying it through Dataflow, and ultimately you're monitoring it. Does this all make sense? Any questions so far? All right, it's a good segue. I'm going to like demonstrate something. Um, hopefully, things will work. We'll find out. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I uh, I have Spring Cloud Dataflow already running in Kubernetes. And there's a bunch of components here, but the specific one that I'm going to highlight here is SCDF server. This is the boot application, uh, which includes that dashboard, which I'll show momentarily. And there's Skipper, which helps with the rolling upgrade CI CD type of experience. Uh, we'll skip that for now. <laughs> Skipper, skip that for now. But then we have Prometheus for monitoring, uh, which is what we're going to showcase uh, in terms of monitoring and metrics experience. There's MySQL for metadata management. And of course, we are using Kafka here for stream processing. Uh, so those Spring Cloud Stream applications that we're going to deploy, they're going to communicate with Kafka for PubSub. And then the other ones I'll skip for, for a minute. So it's already running. And the way how I access Dataflow is uh, go find the uh, external IP. I believe I already had it open, or maybe not. Yeah, it is, it is here. So this is the dashboard uh, that, that is bundled within the boot app that we ship. It's a binary. So we provide a, a jar, a Uber jar, or a Docker image. Depending on your platform that you're running, you can get the, and download the binary that we ship and then like push it to the cloud and then start using it. Uh, this is the app list, app registry. We have about like, you know, 70 apps, uh, roughly. We have all kinds of uh, uh, sources, processors, and sync for you to use. So if you, you, don't, you don't need to like, if you want to like consume data from database, you don't have to write an application for that. We have an app for it. If you want to write to Cassandra, we have an app for it. So most of the common use cases, you'd be able to like take advantage of this out of the box catalog of apps. Uh, but if you want to like register new ones, you'd go in here and bulk import it from, from a properties file or register each app by, by its type and provide the Maven coordinate of what that app is uh, hosted, where that app is hosted, and off you go. It's available in the palette. Speaking of palette, that's the stream page. So this is the palette. It's actually super shrunk, so I'm going to like expand this a little bit. 
Uh, so this is the drag and drop experience that I'm talking about. So we also have a client tool like CLI experience. We also provide RESTful API if you want to programmatically create these types of topologies. All of that is supported as well. So these are those apps, same apps that you saw in the catalog. You can drag and drop and build the pipeline, right? So I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit here, copy paste to DSL. And what we are going to highlight here specifically is, uh, my bad, I forgot to like walk through the use case itself. The use case is this. So have all kinds of credit card transactions happening in real time. And all those transactions are going to a, a, a database. In this case, it's Postgres. My goal is to like capture those events as and when they happen. And that's, that's what change data capture as a design pattern gets into, right? So you don't want to, like, as a consumer, you don't want to pull and make a query to get the new data. You should be in a position to react as and when there is a new entry in a table, for example. And change data capture specifically is a design pattern that helps with that. And we, are, we have an application in our app catalog. It's called CDZ, Debezium. Um, that application's purpose is that exactly it connects to Postgres as and when the new rows are uh, uh, landing in the table. It's going to get that event, and it's going to be automatically consuming those, those new rows. And then it's going to like send it to a downstream consumer. In this case, it's a countersink. So for each row, it goes you know, from left to right. So there are only two apps in this pipeline. And ultimately, I'm going to show a, a a, a dashboard of some kind in terms of incre increasing count. Uh, hopefully, if this all works, you will see it all in action. So I copy the DSL, and this is exactly the same pipeline what I showed in the slide. And if you, you know, the DSL has a bunch of uh, properties here, but it all goes back to like specifically the connection properties for Postgres. Uh, it's probably not very, very clear for the folks in the back, but yeah, you can see it's about like host name, password, port. And then, then the schema name, things like that. So it's all connection properties, really. Uh, it's an out-of-the-box app. You can customize it. You can, the CDC Debezium also supports other databases, such as SQL Server, MySQL. Uh, if you want to connect, uh, connect to MySQL, you, know, you don't have to write an app for that. It's already out there. You would exactly get the change data ex uh, capture experience using that, this app for MySQL as well. And then the second app, in this case, is Counter. And the Counter only ha has a counter name, which goes by the name called Records, and that's it. Uh, so what I'm going to switch now is to the pod list and show that there is no pod app pods running. These are all infrastructure, the components that Dataflow uses at the runtime uh, for metrics monitoring, database, and so on, right? I'm going to create this stream. I'm going to call it maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, S1P stream or something like that. Uh, and then create this stream, and I'm going to deploy this stream. And this is another opportunity for you to tweak the credentials. This goes back to if you have a set of streams that you want to customize for deployment, like increasing CPU capacity or memory capacity, or you don't want to override any of the deployment properties, uh, we, this view helps you change those experience and, and of course, like modify from, from the DSL view as well. So I'm deploying the stream. And as soon as I hit deploy, so you should see uh, this new part starting, right? So there are two apps. The red ones are the ones that are in the process of starting. Uh, one is, of course, the counter one, and then the CDZ Debezium source. Uh, those two apps are natively running in the platform, uh, natively taking advantage of the platform capabilities, including resiliency, uh, logging, metrics. Uh, you know, if something, if this app crashes, Kubernetes is going to bring it back up. But when it's bringing back up, uh, given Spring Cloud Stream, the way how it's architected, uh, as soon as it comes back up, it's going to like consume from the last offset, for example, in Kafka. Uh, and that way, you'd, you'd guarantee for order, guarantee for uh, you know, data processing, so you won't lose any data is what I'm trying to get to. So it's going through a start, a start experience, right? It roughly takes about like a, uh, one and a half minute for each of the uh, parts to start. Uh, but you can see these applications are in the process of like, you know, bootstrapping, uh, making connection to Kafka automatically. This is you as a developer, and I as a developer, I didn't have to do anything. So I just like uh, blindly pointed out, these are two apps, and this is how I want my app to connect and deploy, and Dataflow just deployed it with all the well-defined topic names and, and other Spring Cloud Stream properties that, that the apps require, and they start and automatically come together as coherent streaming pipeline. Um, does this all make sense? Any questions on this so far? OK. Let's see. Uh, it's almost coming together. And while it's coming together, I'm going to talk about a simulator app which is what I was skipping early on. Uh, we have um, a generator, and the generator's sole purpose is this. It's just like going to generate credit card transactions. And specifically, we choose a, a data set from Kaggle. Anybody, anyone familiar with Kaggle? Yep, 
few of you. So Kaggle is an open source, uh, uh, open source. <laughs> it's an open environment for, for getting any open you know, data sets. And we chose the fraud data set for our, for our demonstration. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a CSV file. And this, this generator, all it's doing is it's just like probing the CSV file and reading one line, one row at a time, and then writing to Postgres CDC. Um, so let's make sure this applications are started. But now it, sh it shows they're all running, like these two rows. Let's go back to the UI, make sure these things are running. And uh, I'm in the, it's deployed, ready to go. And you can notice, you'll notice this Grafana icon here. This is what I meant by Dataflow unifies the monitoring experience, right? So now you just like click it, uh, just go to Grafana. <coughs> Automatically, you would now be in a position to like monitor these apps at runtime, right? If you have like n number of these apps, imagine you're scaling it. Imagine you are um, auto scaling it, or imagine you're doing partitioning. You know, you you you'd, you'd be able to like probe into things like CPU memory threads and you know, open files and uh, you'll get this real-time view of how things are reacting at runtime. And we'll downstream from that once when you go to the advanced uh, demonstration, you'll see how the alerts are going to like define our dynamic topology adjustments as well. So this is an applications view. You can go to the streams view. You will get an idea of how streams help look overall. This is, uh, I have only one stream running with two apps, right? And that's what it's showing to a total app count and one stream. And the overall cumulative, the two apps are consuming about like 300 meg memory. And that's what it's showing. Um, so this is nothing, right? I mean, we're just getting the highlight, highlighting the experience. Um, but once we go into the advanced demo now, you'll get an idea of what, what we are talking about for more complex scenarios. So I'm going to now uh, open up the database uh, before I start the. Yeah, unfortunately, we didn't clean up the database. It already had some data, but we won't be able to like see that new data coming in. Uh, but let's assume that the, it's this is generating data, and it's going to that CDC uh, that slide that I was showing early on, and and then the CDC is Debezium is capturing it, and I'm going to have a counter exp uh, dashboard here, which which should be highlighting it. So it's already like you can see this is. This is a very simplest demo, hello world of some kind. We want to start with, start with this and incrementally go into an advanced use case. So this is also updating in real time. We are using the same um, Prometheus and Grafana stack, not only to monitor the streams and apps, but also like get into analytics a bit, right? So you, are, you, you don't have to like go choose another tool, tool, tool for it. Uh, it just like happens to be part of the same tool chain and you are, you are just like leveraging uh, uh, Prometheus as a time series database to like do this types of interaction as well. I'm not sure it's updating, however. Yeah, let's see. Uh, this is the Debesium. That's going to some sort of, uh, it's, it seems healthy. No, they're all config server. That's, that's, an, uh, that's a warning. That's, uh, Oh, generator, yeah, it's a good point. So let's go check the generator, see if there are any errors in it. Generator seems to do its thing as well. Let's go back and reload this. Yeah. Oh, the numbers seem to have gone from 45 to 75. <laughs> it's, it's maybe, uh, this is from 1439. Uh, somehow it dipped, I, I'm trying to understand why. All right, let's reload the page real, bit, real quick here. Yeah, it's increasing. Uh, that's good. And it's good enough, so I think. So this chart is just like we, we just hacked it up real quick to like show that that rates are coming and it's just like going to a going to a counter and we are just like probing for that bucket in time series database. In this case, it's Prometheus, and you can see this this number is updating. That's an indication that the new rows are coming to CDC and you're able to like leverage this type of existing toolkit to like also like visualize some component, uh, some data that's flowing through these pipelines. So just to repeat, you have application view. Uh, I selected the wrong stream. This is the application view. You will be able to like probe into the latency throughput and things like that. Or you can look into specifically the stream level uh, uh, idea. Or you can alternatively build your own widgets, uh, which could be something like this. And because these data is already in time series database, you'd be able to like take advantage of it and build a custom widget for your need. So that is the first demo. Um, I'm gonna, I don't think we had anything else. Yeah, so 
I'm going to stop here. I'm going to uh, request Christian to jump in and talk about the next set of uh, use cases that we wanted to show you in terms of some more complex monitoring. So recapping what we saw so far, yeah, we were able to collect uh, metrics from distributed data intensive systems. Also, we'll be able, were able to produce metrics about some financial uh, transactions that are happening and monitor all these, uh, uh, both those streams with uh, time series databases like uh, uh, Prometheus. Uh, I'm jumping a li little bit ahead there. But uh, when we're talking about uh, how this source of data and these workloads like metrics from me coming from the applications or from the different clusters, as well as financial transactions like the credit card transactions, there's, they, they have something very common in, in, as, as original characteristics. And they tend to be called uh, time series type of data. So what's very characteristic for characteristic or specific for this type of uh, data loads, it's transactional data load. It's like the most generic transactional data loads we're interested to, to to understand and to process this information in real time, which makes per perfect sense for monitoring and for financial transactions. We want really to be able to act upon this information as soon as we can, and we detect some interesting behavior there. So uh, we focus on the um, um, uh, most recent aspect of this. And one of the most important, maybe specifics uh, of this time series data is, is that it is uh, uh, ordered by timestamps. So the common for all these data sources. And actually, you can put in, the, in this same um, um, uh, bucket the uh, various IoT sources of uh, information. So all your devices out there that produce data, they have these common characteristics. Actually, they produce data in strict, monolithically increasing sequence of based on the time. This is important characteristics of this data because it allows you to structure it and, and process it in a certain moment, in certain way. And, uh, um, <coughs> The, what that means is that unlike the hierarchical representation of metrics, like how many of you are familiar with GMX, Java Messaging uh, Extensions? So it's a common, very old, actually over 10 years old, metric systems where actually you have, in advance, you have to decide what are the type of metrics, how you're going to aggregate the metrics that you want to, to build a dashboard of it and analyze. And then once you have done this and this uh, data starts to flow, there is no easy way actually you can re-aggregate or perform uh, some new insights. With time series databases and time series uh, data sources, this is slightly different because of the structure of, um, of the time series itself, usually along with the time series uh, uh, the time events or the, the time events which are ordered by by timestamps you can assign key value pairs which are called commonly ticket uh, labels or dimensions and uh, this allows you later on to perform various uh, complex aggregation time range aggregation across these uh, data sets over time so this is an in, in, in interesting um, aspect because it allows for the uh, this type of workload to be arranged and and uh, um, and structured in a way that allows you to process huge amount of data you can think that internet of things or metrics of different uh, uh, hundreds of nodes ac spread across uh, or thousands of nodes spread across uh, multiple clusters, and you would like to be able to monitor and, and analyze this information in real time. So based on this uh, specifics of the uh, data structure that we receive, various uh, uh, tools are built called time series databases that optimize for this time, type, type of uh, data sets. And uh, data flow is actually, Spring Cloud data flow is integrated with a couple of those uh, tools. Uh, um, in order to integrate with this, we actually benefit uh, from a um, uh, very tiny and uh, powerful library called uh, Micrometer. How many of you have used Micrometer and know what it does? So Micrometer is a very facet library. You can think like log4j to access to different stuff, but it allows you to connect to multitude of uh, most popular time series databases. Dataflow comes out of the box with support of Prometheus, which is one of the most popular databases, especially in the Kubernetes space, and in FluxDB. But you can actually use it uh, and reuse uh, the Spring Cloud Stream and Spring Cloud Task application, which are boot application in nature, and connect them to the um, all supported database, I think, 20 or 30 different databases, um, time series databases are supported. And when we talk about uh, Micrometer, Spring Cloud, it is already pre-built in Spring Boot, so it comes out of the box for you. Spring Boot provides uh, very essential metrics like the CPU, the file descriptors, memory. You can get all this uh, as, as, as a time sources out of the box from the... Um, <coughs> Any Spring Boot application. On top of this, Spring integration has additional met metrics that allows you to, met to monitor, for example, the, the channel, uh, trans uh, channel rates. 
and spring cloud task allows you to meter, meter and uh, monitor the uh, longitude of the end rate of the task durations. Similarly, Spring Batch comes with additional extension of, of, of uh, metrics um, uh, tooling on top of the uh, spring, uh, spring Boot using leveraging against Micrometer to provide uh, uh, time rates for various uh, batch processing. All this comes together and is actually leveraged by Spring Cloud Dataflow and um, by, via Spring Cloud Stream and Spring Task. And uh, having all this in place and this context uh, in place, we were going to extend the existing uh, demo and actually enlarge it in, instead of just printing a counter from, from the recorded, uh, the, from the credit card records that we received, we we'll try to make actually a little bit, something a little bit more um, sophisticated and try to detect uh, fraudulent uh, transaction amongst those input uh, transactions. For, for the purpose of this, uh, um, exercise, and maybe here I can jump in and start preparing the pipe, uh, the the pipeline that does this. And while it's deploying, I will uh, explain the details of what's going on. So I'm going to stop. Replace this pipeline. You just can make sure that um, the two applications that we were running are discarded now and removed. To make it slightly different, I'm actually going to use the command line tool, which data flow, and create uh, the pipeline that we're going to. So it's practically the same uh, the same type of stream. We're creating CDCD DBSM with, as a source with all the verbose properties to connect to the Postgres database. Then um, and, and the, the pipeline ends up with a specific counter, which is kind of modified of the counter that we saw before. And in between, we have a um, processor code fraud detection, which actually loads some preloaded model that uh, I would explain how it works. So having this pipeline in place, we can go ahead and deploy it. Uh, there is some, as uh, Sabi mentioned out, when you deploy application, you have the, the ability to actually pass additional deployment property to additionally configure the, the, the non-functional aspect of this application. And in this case, we practically are leveraging and configuring the Kafka binder that is going to mediate the communication between our stream applications, uh, defining some partitioning and topic uh, uh, structures for communication between them. Well, those are Yeah, we can see that now we have the pipeline, streaming pipeline, composed of three applications. The the fraud detection Debezium source, the processor in between, which is supposed to detect um, fraudulent transactions, and the counter that is supposed to uh, consume this detected uh, output and visualize it and pass it as a separate uh, metric stream. While this is being deployed, let's go back to our demo and talk a little bit more about the whole setup and how we go to the fraud detection um, use case in general. So we studied some popular um, use cases and how people are approaching it. It happens that Kaggle um, uh, uh, provides a very nice data set. I think it's third release of this data set that comes from a real um, uh, credit card company, anonymized data sets, and there is a multitude of solutions and different attempts that people use in trying to, to, to this is a challenge there, trying to, to solve this problem, to find more, more accurate uh, 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 solution that can detect uh, transaction or fra uh, fraudulent uh, transaction within da this data set. So uh, in addition to, to take, taking the, the provided data sets, we also picked one of the most popular solutions uh, for solving this problem, which uh, happens to be a TensorFlow-based uh, uh, model. TensorFlow is a data deep learning, uh, machine learning uh, toolkit. And um, we use this um, solution in order and the provided data set to pre-train the, the model and use it for real-time inference. When I talk about pre-training, um, 
Uh, how many of you are familiar with machine learning or have done something? So there is something, very, just one, one sentence about this. Unlike the traditional programming imperative where we're actually coding uh, the solution in, within our code, so practically in our um, code, tells how certain input or some transaction, um, uh, credit card transaction should be mapped to uh, possible fraudulent or not fraudulent uh, output. With machine learning, it's slightly different. It's inverted. So we don't code the instruction itself, but we actually annotate the data sets in order to, uh, for each input transaction, we actually explicitly label it, whether it's, in this case, uh, fraudulent or not fraudulent. And so this training data set is passed to the algorithm machine learning algorithm we, we have uh, decided to use. And with multiple iteration validations, we can reach to a point, actually the algorithm would come to some hidden function that would map the input transactions to eventual um, um, fraudulent or non-fraudulent outcome as uh, labels. And um, this, uh, when you have satisfied usually the model that we have picked and we have trained, I think have accuracy reached something like 96 or 97% of uh, uh, success. Um, you can actually take this pre-trained model and use it, uh, especially in the context of TensorFlow. This is uh, Technically, it is a protobuf uh, binary file that you can use and you and, and put um, um, as a and build a processor around it. Lucky for us, we already have a TensorFlow processor in, amongst the uh, multi set of catalog of applications that we provide. We have TensorFlows with uh, some variations for object detection, for sentiment analysis. And in our case, we just extended this uh, basic uh, TensorFlow processor with fraud detection capabilities. Practically the only difference is to make it aware of the specific transaction input and uh, the output that is, in our case, a JSON message that has fraudulent or non-fraudulent output. OK. Let's see how we're doing with the deployment. It seems like. We have our stream running. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, we have some, yeah, it is not, we, we didn't uh, drain our Kafka stream. So what you can see is that the CDC Debezium actually doesn't produce anything at the moment. So um, this is the source of our pipeline. It's not in order. So the fraud detection, though, uh, uh, component still consumes some events that apparently were uh, locked in our Kafka binder that comes from the previous uh, test that we run. And uh, so actually, it would take and those, uh, those uh, transactions, practically a process for frauds, and the output is sent to the counter uh, component. So you can see that actually the rates of those two components is the same, while there is no any input. And when I talk about rates, uh, how, how many of you have used Grafana or Prometheus before? So practically in our setup, we use Grafana that is connected to Prometheus, so our metrics are stored in Prometheus. And um, when you use Prometheus and the query language for Prometheus, it looks something like this. So this is the expression. So you can compute a rate over a matrix. And this spring integration matrix send seconds is something that already is built in the spring integration application. and as a such, it comes uh, um, um, to Spring Cloud Stream applications. So practically, this is the techniques that for certain type of um, uh, metrics that are not error channel, that are not new channel, we can compute. And now yeah, you can have some filters for application uh, or stream names over a certain period of time. This is how you compute the aggregation, which is operation per seconds. I'm mentioning this because we can use this for some uh, clever extension later on. I'm going to reuse it again the same generator, which is going to produce uh, um, some transaction. Uh, with this generator, we can actually play a little bit and uh, increase or decrease the um, volume of, tr of fraudulent transactions that comes as an input, which uh, hopefully would allow us to, to build a nice, dash nice dashboard on top of it. You can see that uh, um, the CDC Debezium already started to consume some um, input transactions. 
those transactions, which are just a row of data, um, are passed to the fraud detection uh, model. The fraud detection is a processor that takes our pre-trained uh, TensorFlow model. And based on this model, it actually estimates the probability for this transaction to be fraudulent and not fraudulent, which is represented as just as JSON message passed to the counter object. And the counter object um, is um, another out-of-the-box object that we provide that internally uses micrometer to allow you to dynamically generate a new metrics that can be stored in the same or different uh, time series database. In our case, we're creating a new time series stream that actually tells us uh, whether which has two states, fraudulent, not fraudulent. And in turn, this can be actually consumed and visualized with Grafana. And that's what we have done with uh, this dashboard here. So practically, we, build, we have built a dashboard that consumes the output of this uh, uh, <laughs> counter metrics. And when I talk about counter metrics, Maybe it would help to show, or maybe not. OK, so this counter is configured to create a new metrics code counter. That is what's going to, to be sent to our Prometheus database, in our case, time series database. And additionally, to each metric sample that we send there, counter can actually extract some, um, uh, some valuable information, in our case, is JSON path in order to extract uh, the value of the detection output, whether it's fraudulent or not, and pass it as a key value or label, which is passed, on, uh, uh, passed along with the uh, metrics to the backend. OK, let's close this. So at the moment, we have very low rate of, uh, of messages that have been passed. Um, one interesting question would be, what would happen? OK, we already have end-to-end -end system that, um, um, when running, actually, it, it real time consumes transactions, can use CDC to, to consume uh, input uh, stream of uh, database transactions, use uh, TensorFlow model pre-trained in order to detect the fraudulent transaction among those, and with the counter produce a new metrics that can be used to build the dashboard that I've just um, shared, showed here. No. What, but another common scenario is what would happen if the amount of credit transactions as some event happens, just raise and boom. So how, um, how this system end-to-end -to -end would cope. And this reflects back to, to what Sabi started with, how the system actually can scale up and down in case of uh, such an events. And in order to simulate this type of uh, behavior, I'm going to increase actually the rate of input of transaction that we're sending to the Postgres database and see how our system reacts upon this, uh, this event. Something like, maybe, oops, actually started. Okay, so now I would expect that uh, the rate of CDCDBZM actually would uh, uh, start jumping. And what we would observe is that actually while the, the CDC, the source can consume incoming transaction in higher rate, as actually with almost with the rate that actually they produce in the source database, the fraud detection, which is very CPU intensive process that uses uh, uh, TensorFlow deep learning model in the need, actually cannot cope with the same speed. And um, one of the questions is how actually we can remedy this, this situation. One common approach is to, and actually the only approach is to horizontally scale. So we have to find a way how we can actually increase the number of fraud detection instances, processor instances. The good things about this use case is that this is typically, yes, this is typical um, uh, embarrassingly parallelized uh, use case. So we can actually freely uh, ex increase the number of uh, fraud detection if we can. And uh, eventually this would cop. So you can see that now the input is already, let's make it even more drastic. I don't. Six. So uh, on, on this side, you can see that the, the, the throughput is about 20, 30 operations per second, while the input already reaches 60 operations per second. And um, 
if you are running on Kubernetes, the one common approach to, to, to solve this problem is to use uh, solutions like the HPO, or this is horizontal port uh, auto scaling, although it's out of life. This is one of the most popular way to do, solve this problem at infrastructure level. So you can use CPU or memory, some, some metrics that come from the, uh, from the cluster where you're running your, uh, your, your applications in order to scale application up or down. But uh, if you want to have some more sophisticated signals when and you would like actually your application to, to, to run, you would like to have a metrics that comes from your application level itself. And in our case, I still don't see the significant difference here. Let's make it three. And um, wouldn't it be nice if we see this kind of discrepancy between the throughput between those, our source and our processor, to use this as a signal to actually scale more, proce more processors. And on the reverse, when this uh, discrepancy is zero, there is no difference between the throughput of those applications, actually reduce the scale to one. And actually, that's, that's what uh, um, Prometheus allows you to do. We already compute the rate. We can actually create something like this. Let's make it five minutes only to hide. OK, so practically, I've just created a query that looks uh, like this one. And while talking about this, yeah. Actually, yeah, I would explain this, uh, what's happening already. But uh, as a result of uh, our uh, triggering and our auto scaling, actually our system already detected that there is a discrepancy and our source sends much more events than the processor can pro produce and it already spawned three additional fraud detection uh, processors that eventually would be able to cope. So practically our graph is we have a single source for the processors for detecting um, um, uh, <coughs> fraudulent uh, transactions and single counters. And the control of this uh, Signal actually comes from alert uh, managers that is provided by, by, by Prometheus itself. So Prometheus comes with a tool called alert uh, manager that allows us to use the, reuse the same um, uh, queries that we use to build the dashboards and get insights, but actually build alerts on this. And we actually could build a difference or deltas like this. So if you remember the averages, so practically the averages of the uh, application name called CDC Debezium minus the average of the application called fraud detection. And this actually is the graph that we show. And we can use this as a signal to trigger the, the auto detection. It also allow us to, uh, Prometheus, um, uh, the Prometheus Alert Manager allow us to plug uh, our own webhooks and we build a simple uh, micro, um, microservices uh, or Spring Boot application that uh, listens for, for, um, for events from the that comes from the from the alert manager, and uh, eventually use the the Kubernetes uh, native uh, Java client in order to spawn uh, additional ports for handling uh, multi multiple instances of the processor that we're interested. I stop this. Uh, uh, application to me. So the moment I stop the input of the transaction, you can see that this equation that comp computes the difference between the averages, um, between the application rates um, of the source and processor actually would invert because now we would have more our CDCD Bizium source actually is uh, going to zero. Well, we have a lot of uh, message accumulated in our binder, but fortunately we have already spawned a few additional, see up to now, up to this moment where actually the alert manager triggered the, the difference and, and the new instances have created. Now we have at least four uh, processors that would handle this load until actually everything is normalized to zero and uh, there will be an opposite uh, uh, criteria that actually compare, checks for, for, for this difference and for when it reaches zero, it would scale down the application. And um, I 
I should have started explaining what is the use case in general, but you can see that this is the same use case, the same pipeline that we built and stuff. Simply it's handling one using the, the time series and metrics in order to, um, as an insight, in order to help the pipeline itself to scale up or down in order to handle and uh, support these transactions mechanism as they stream as it, uh, it comes. And uh, here I'll uh, hand over to any questions. I know that it's very complex topics and we've been trying to keep it very high light. There is already GitHub repositories. We're going to publish a blog that will try to get more into details about it. But we've been trying to, to, to give the suggestions what, what, what's happening inside. Yeah, sure. Yep. Uh, the good, that's a good question, and uh, yeah, we show this because we've been doing some some good effort trying to provide this integration out of the box, uh, and at least for a couple of, of Grafana, for, for Prometheus and InfluxDB, you can expect that uh, uh, data flow would come uh, out of the box configured with Grafana and, and the dashboards for those two databases. Yeah, so on different platforms. Yes. Configuration is just the data flow itself, right? So if you are running in, are you running a data flow in Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes? Okay, Cloud Foundry, right? So you would have something called a manifest file. If you aren't using the data flow tile, that is, you would have a manifest file, you'd have a Spring application JSON, right? And I shouldn't be opening it because it has some passwords in it right now, but, uh, oh, it's not even my laptop. But yeah, so your manifest file will have a Spring application JSON, and in that JSON, you would provide key value pairs of Prometheus or InfluxDB, whatever the connection properties are. So it has a prefix that we provide Spring Cloud, Spring .cloud .data flow. Uh, dot metrics, dot whatever stream or task, and downstream from that Prometheus configuration. So it's, it's as simple as that. It's globally done once, and that's it. And and then you, as soon as you have that configured, uh, you would see those icons come up in dashboard automatically. So, does that, that answer your question? Okay. All right. Any other questions before before we switch to the next demo? All right. Cool. We are almost in the end of it as the last demo that I'm going to like switch uh, to the slide real quick and I'm going to talk about this one. So we talked about model training, right? So this is where uh, the other side of uh, the use case is not about just like event-driven stream processing all the time. But if you think of a model training like routine, uh, if, you, if you have to think about like data size versus model accuracy, the more the amount of data is when the more accurate the model is, right? So if you have like enough data, the model accuracy is somewhat mediocre, right? But if you have like more data, your accuracy is gonna be like phenomenally good. I mean, the, the model that we chose, which has a success rate of 97% or something like that. So you can imagine how much data it might have like taken into account in terms of training that model to pro provide this type of ex uh, accurate experience for us. And likewise, if you, if you compare the time window it takes for you to uh, compute an ac accurate model, um, it's again, it's a, it, it depends on the data size, right? So the more the data, obviously it's gonna take a long time to run uh, ultimately, you have an accurate model, but you, you get the idea of data sizes as the time it takes to like compute. Um, so you need a you need some sort of a you know a more. And if you'd want to operate these types of use cases, you need somewhat like a, a dynamic deployment topology. And that deployment topology is where we uh, bring in cloud native batch experience and data flow. So in this case, you know you can think of some sort of a data type cyclic graph. It, it, it receives credit card data, whatever it's, it has got in real time, and then it, you have a historical amount of credit card transactions that's sitting in some sort of a data lake of some kind. And you'd want to like merge them, and ultimately you want to like do some sort of a sanitizing, and then finally run the training model. But what we do in this case is each of those steps are short-lived. I mentioned about Spring Cloud Task early on. Each of those tasks, uh, the, the components in this graph is a Spring Cloud Task app. Each of them run as an ephemeral process uh, when that you know, merge process is complete, that merge container would be shut down. It won't be running all the time. So that's, that's the, uh, so this type of use case, when you have a model training like uh, use case, you would take advantage of Spring Cloud Task and you'd be able to like, uh, leverage this type of deployment uh, option that we provide in Dataflow. So let's see this in action, right? So this is, uh, I'm just gonna like mimic as if this, I'm gonna like train the model right now, but obviously we won't have time to like uh, finish the entire data set. So I'm gonna like use a mock application just to highlight how this type of deployment is possible in Dataflow and how we can monitor for these types of apps as well. Uh, let me uh, destroy the stream. 
while I'm here. So we don't want to chew up the environment. And let's make sure all the parts where it goes away. So those parts are like in the process of terminating and they will clean up and it'll go back to the desired provision state that we started originally. Um, I have an application with the name uh, Mock. Uh, this is nothing but a, it just randomly uh, sleeps for like a few seconds and then finishes up its operation. So it just so that you will have some variation in the graph when we see the, uh, when you go for monitoring these types of apps. So this application is, uh, is in my Docker registry. I registered that. I'm gonna use that application to like build a graph. And that graph is gonna look something like, uh, something like this, if I can copy that, copy paste this. So this is exactly what you saw in the, in the chart. Uh, only, only it's just this, again, a drag and drop experience. This is top to bottom, in, unlike stream processing, which is always like linear left to right. Uh, this is top to bottom. And I just use the compose task DSL that we have in Dataflow to like build this out. And I'm just gonna create this task, right? So let's call it uh, S1P task demo, something like that. Uh, create the task. And this is the same graph. Uh, once again, I can change the deployment properties if I wish. I can do the same thing in from the uh, dashboard or in the shell. Uh, but I'm gonna just simply launch it. So once when I launch it, uh, what I want you all to like uh, pay attention to in the, in the Kubernetes console here is uh, you will see that my compost task runner, uh, where am I? So you will see there are containers creating. This is my credit card extraction app and then uh, credit card data, they are running. So you will see once when that application finishes of its operation, if I have to like go into like one of the logs for instance, um, it just is, is wrapped up almost there, right? You will see that that container is just like uh, in the process of saying completed, it's shut down. It's not chewing up your CPU or memory capacity in your cluster. It's, it's, it's just like it did its job, right? It, it extracted data and I'm done with it. And then it goes to the control, goes to the next one. In this case, it happens to merge. Right now, merge operation is running. It's doing its thing. It's, it's a Spring Cloud task app. And once when this application is complete, and that container will shut down. So you see how, how these, this type of you know, orchestration, uh, when you have this type of use case where which you wanna run some, some sort of an offline style model training uh, routine where each of the steps can, can only run for only finite period of time, you would then choose Compose Task as a feature that we have in Dataflow and goes through and crunch, crunching through each of those apps that we have defined in the graph. So if I refresh here, so the Compose Task itself is, Compose Task Runner itself is running. That's the one coordinating, launching all this uh, uh, different apps part of the graph. Um, but once when all of the apps complete, the Compose Task gracefully also shuts down and it frees up the resources uh, for as well. Uh, so let's see what's going on, right? So I'm gonna launch the uh, Grafana, same exact thing. What we saw, what we've been doing now is every application that we demonstrated today, the streams, the data flow, uh, the task application, all of them are like connected to the same Prometheus stack behind, in the back end. All of these applications are consistently producing uh, metrics via micrometer meter registry for Prometheus. And they're all going to the same time series database. And we are using the same dashboard that we saw before. And if I go to the apps now, no, nothing should be running really, right? So all of that sh sh is, is shut, shut down by now because everything finished its, its, its operation. They're all like cleanly shut down. Uh, but if I go to the task view, which is also an out-of-the-box view that we ship, uh, you can see there's a task that's, that's, it's transient, right? I mean, it, Prometheus captured it. Uh, but if I, once when I like, once when it goes to that specific state, uh, which one is this? This is the fraud model. It took about nine seconds to run. And, and you can see all the various different steps that it, how much time it took. Uh, but once when you, if you have a more complex scenario, this is just like simply printing out uh, in a system out print LN with some sort of a message and then shuts down after random uh, time wait. But if you have a real bad job that takes like a few hours or like a few, few days even for you to complete, you'd be able to like drill into those specifics uh, and then understand what might be going on in, in each of the steps within your bad job uh, and, and what the specific act, uh, activity that you can track down. So that's a Spring Cloud task, right? So just wanted to highlight that we, we cover streams and tasks equally and provide the monitoring and met metrics experience again equally. Uh, from running in Dataflow. Um, just a few more slides. Does this all make sense? Any questions on tasks? Does the last step run in the same 
Yes. Yeah, I mean, the common pattern that we see is, uh, you know, because they are transient by nature, uh, you, people uh, pipe that log to a APM tooling, like log analytics tooling. Most of our customers do like Splunk, Dynatrace, and things like that. Uh, they send that to a common backend where logs are persisted all the time, and you can do some offline analytics on the logs even. Uh, but we don't, we don't do anything in Dataflow itself. Dataflow is just like a simple Spring Boot app, right? It uses database for simple metadata, and that's it. Uh, but it's up to you. A platform might come with a logging solution. Like, for example, if you're using PCF, you'll have PCF metrics. I believe it retains logs for about two weeks. Uh, so you'll have two weeks worth of data that you can track. Otherwise, you can pipe that to Splunk right systems for persistence. Yes. No, that's what, that's what I'm saying. So if you need to CF logs, uh, you will not be able to get to the logs because the, the container is gone. There is no footprint for it. But then if you go to PCF metrics, which is an add-on in PCF, right? In the apps manager, you would be able to like go to PCF metrics. Uh, and, and, when, and there you, you will have the facility to like go find for that application by, in the dropdown. When you click it, and you will have a history for the last two weeks for that app type. There's that option in Cloud Foundry at least. Question? Yes. <laughs> I'll open up a slide. I'm going to have Christian speak about it. Go ahead, Christian. So I'm going to actually, no, no, I'm just going to actually open up the slide so you can speak to the, this is the architecture, really. Um, so we don't use the prom, prom or gator. Uh, we, we, were, <laughs> we were using it, but we don't use it anymore. Uh, this is all kinds of complexity that, that we have to like run into. But yeah, so something that we don't advise using in production setting as well. But we have something called Prometheus or Socket Proxy, uh, which is a supported project. And it's built by uh, the X micrometer lead. And it's supported by Spring now. And uh, which, uh, it sort of takes away that service discovery piece uh, from the equation. It's not even a tile. It's, it's just the logo here, right? So it's, it's a small application. Uh, Christian, you want to jump in? Help, help out. Microphone. Hello. Okay. So, uh, uh, as you may, uh, as the Promigator. How many of you have you heard about Promigator? Okay. So, um, when we talk about Prometheus, I didn't mention this uh, time series database like Prometheus or other. There is this different nature because they, they aim to optimize for this time series um, uh, workload. They do it differently. And the Prometheus actually does it by pulling the metrics from the end target system, which is very different from InfluxDB or actually majority of other uh, of the, the, the rest of time series databases. And because of this, if you have a dynamically spawn uh, in, in our case, a uh, micro uh, subset of uh, or distributed set of uh, microservices, you have to somehow communicate the location of IP addresses and the entry points of those services to Prometheus so that Prometheus can scrap, it's called scrapping, these metrics in real time. And so the first task that you have to, 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 to provide is to provide a um, service discovery mechanism, even if it's, we not talk about Promigator. So in order to, um, to, allow to pass this information about this dynamically uh, started and, and discarded uh, microservices to Prometheus. So this was a hard task. We used to have a home-built uh, uh, service discovery mechanism within Dataflow in order to accommodate these uh, this, uh, requirements that internally was talking with Dataflow, extracting information about the currently spawned task or, or actually only streams. That was our initial support and was providing this to time series one. You actually want to deploy this um, um, this setup in its systems on platform like Cloud Foundry, um, actually Prometheus came with additional constraints. Actually, it requires it passes some specific header messages in order to communicate, and the protocol is very specific, which actually is blocked and because of the routing mechanism with, with Cloud Foundry was not allowed to work properly within this system. So, in order to remediate this uh, this uh, this solution, another tool came up. It was I'm not sure who created it. We contributed to it. It was called Promigator, which actually helped to mediate the communication between Prometheus and the application running on Cloud Foundry. It also played the role of of service discovery as well, but it helped to solve. And, and then when you start to support, for example, it turns out that if you want to support uh, uh, 
this configuration from Cloud Foundry, you have to have a Promagator or something. If you want to run into Kubernetes, you have to be different. And so you have this discrepancy of, of solutions and architecture that you have to support on, from the standpoint of data flow. And, and furthermore, it gets even more complicated you, if you have a tasks. So Prometheus, this is pool-based information. What would happen if you spawn a task and it disappeared before actually Prometheus was able to, to. So then, in order to remedy this problem, you have to put yet another component called push gateway, part of the service, which actually mm. inverts the interactions. And it was kind of hell of, of mesh of problems. And until uh, Prometheus R socket uh, uh, came into pass. So the, the, the Prometheus R socket proxy is practically an application. You can have actually a cluster of those, they can scale. That builds a R socket connection over TCP or WebSocket with all your applications. So those are durable um, R socket connections, so that, it, that they would be recreated. And at the moment when Prometheus actually, and you register only the R proxy as a source to Prometheus. So Prometheus knows only about this single um, uh, component, so it's not dynamic, it's statically registered. And the moment Prometheus actually scrapes, it's okay, give me the metrics. Internally, the Prometheus proxy would activate and use all the R socket connections to extract the metrics from this application and return it to Prometheus. So this allows us to reuse exactly the same infrastructure, uh, uh, run it locally on Kubernetes, on Cloud Foundry, with overcoming all problems that I just mentioned earlier, and also reuse this architecture for stream applications and task application without any problems. That was the, hopefully, reason there. No, no, Don, see your question? Yeah, I'm so glad to know about that. Yeah. This is a new stuff. It's just very yeah, brand yeah, new. It's, 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 it's like yeah. point 0.9 release or something right now, but uh, second, second question, yes. yes. Uh, you're interested in finding out the processor specifically? Okay, I see. Oh, I see what he's saying. So let me copy paste that thing again. Yes. Uh, I believe it's this, right, Christian? Yep. All right. Uh, I'm going to actually, you know what? Let me do differently. This is a new tool. Let me maximize it here so you can parse through it. You Good. can let me put this in new line indeed. So this is the configuration of the processor. You see that one of the parameter is the location of the pre-trained uh, uh, TensorFlow model. That, so the, basically, uh, this is the model file that we are talking about, right? This is a big file. It's sitting in the application itself. It's running in the application container itself. It's con this is the one that's consuming a lot of CPU and memory at runtime. <laughs> Some Siri action going on there. But yeah, so. As in when the upstream flooded with a lot of transactions, suddenly the, the throughput, it's not able to keep up with the incoming data. And as Christian was referring to that delta chart and the way how we use Prometheus query language to like define, go look for upstream throughput and the downstream throughput, do a difference between the both, and use that as a threshold to like decide how, when I should auto scale up and down. So that's how we were able to like scale it up and down. Is that, is that the question or you had more? No, that's it. Okay. All right, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so we sort of like intentionally hit it. <laughs> it was a little complex to like unpack it all for so you, but uh, so I think we can talk about it offline. It's, okay. it's, a, it's a native client, a Kubernetes native client, a Java app we have yeah. that's making an API server call behind the scene to like scale apart up and down. We would use the P PCF autoscaler, uh, but again, that only works with the RabbitMQ, right? So the cube depth option that we have, we don't, it doesn't work with Kafka, for instance. So, good. Maybe you could have mentioned actually the future work, yeah, which go is there. related to, 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 to <laughs> this stuff. So practically, this is kind of exploration we've been doing for the yeah. approach to, to handle this kind of uh, problem. So yeah, I mean, that comes to the conclusion, really. So this is what we, I mean, we talked about a lot of challenges, and I think we briefly unpacked what the tooling that we build and what we focus on can help you with it. So you don't have to go around like figuring out how am I going to stitch about all stitch this all together to run it in production, um, and we are, we don't go and then necessarily rebuild everything, reinvent the wheel by building a micrometer like solution or Prometheus like solution for data flow, but instead we take advantage of those tooling that's out there, and in this case it happens to be Prometheus, micrometer, and Graphon as a combination, and uh, we were able to take advantage of it, sort of reasonably. We touched on some R scaling things, uh, you know. We didn't get into the partition data and things like that, but you get the idea. You would be in a position to like monitor for all those types of scenarios. And a real quick plug on some of the things that we are working on. Yeah, Spring Cloud Stream, Task, and Data Flow, it's all part of the same team. Uh, we're all in the same team. 
This is the current milestone in the second column, the, and everything is set to go GA. And the monitoring experience that you saw today is, is all available for M2 release. Uh, you should be able to try it out, give us feedback. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us for any questions and concerns. And this, the monitoring roadmap specifically goes into your question. So we are planning to add a native command in the Spring Cloud Dataflow, uh, a scale command. So that would allow, and if we had that command, uh, the Prometheus webhook would have invoked the Dataflow's REST API to scale that pod, as opposed to us having to worry about a Kate's uh, a Java client that we are running behind the scene to do that in this demo. Uh, yeah, so we, 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 are, we have that as a roadmap. And the other important thing is Kafka Streams, and I saw Sobi somewhere here. So Sobi is a Kafka Streams lead. Oleg is the Spring Cloud Stream lead. They're both here. And Sobi is hacking on this Kafka Stream, specifically metrics and monitoring support for it. And that's going, that's, it's a stateful workload. It has an interesting characteristics to it. So we are planning to, again, like extend the same offering from a monitoring perspective. So when you deploy KStreams apps using Dataflow, uh, you would have exactly the same experience that you saw in Prometheus and Grafana today. Um, with that, I believe some resources here, these slides are, will be published somewhere, but it's uh, links to the demo. And the fraud reduction in action is the, um, the actual core of the uh, content that we showed today. And of course, if you have questions about data flow, you can go to microsite and docs. Uh, I forgot to remove the dots there, but <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's the end of it. Any last questions, comments? Yes. So you mentioned you have the MySQL database for two other methods. Is it very lightweight? Can you use actually MySQL database for MySQL database? You mean uh, Dataflow's persistence layer you're talking about? Yeah. yeah so we, we, we do require a relational database. Okay. Yeah. So it, it doesn't have to be MySQL, but some relational database, Oracle DB2. I don't know, SQL Server. <laughs> so wait, it cannot be at CD, Zookeeper like so, uh, solutions. Okay. Yes, question. Uh, uh, data flow itself? Right. Yep. Yeah, so we, we don't break compatibility. We don't break compatibility by in the minor releases, right? So we stick with the spring agenda there. So uh, if you're upgrading from 2.1, 2.2 to 2.3, it should be transparent. We do database migration also behind the scene using Flyway for you. It will. We take care of it. All right. I believe that's the end of it. I'm happy to, we, we are here hanging out. Any questions, you can.